Good evening, everybody. I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to our virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. And whether you're watching on Crowdcast or Facebook Live, we're glad that you could join us this evening. Uh, to those of you new to one of our events, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and ca campaign training for um, young women, and we facilitate research and discussions like this on women in politics. So we know that women were the centerpiece of the 2020 uh, election, even though the two names at the top of each party ticket were men. Um, six women, of course, ran for the Democratic nomination one of whom would ultimately become, of course, vice president. Um, a woman led the general election campaign for Joe Biden, and they were key female political figures in the Democratic Party who certainly played a key supporting role in how this election would unfold. And of course, women voters uh, turned out in record numbers and in many ways um, did decide this election. So tonight, we are excited to talk about women uh, in 2020 with two political reporters, Jonathan Allen and Amy Parnes, who have just published their new book, Lucky, How Joe Biden Barely Won the Presidency. Um, so lots to talk about. Before we start, I wanna let everybody know that we are gonna save plenty of time for questions. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a ask the question button. So please feel free to put your question there and you can also upvote other people's questions. Uh, and if you miss any of the discussion, um, a replay will be available at the same link that you uh, registered on. So with that, Jonathan and Amy, welcome and congrats on the book. Thanks, Thank you, Betsy. Betsy. <laughs> so it's been 141 days since Election Day, and somehow you two have managed to put forth <laughs> a book that chronicles the entire campaign and really takes us behind the scenes of the contentious primaries, uh, the, of course, the COVID dominated summer, uh, virtual conventions, the VP selection process, um, and then the general election itself. So I thought we would just maybe start and set the stage for us a bit, give us a sense of some of those key moments where you all make the case that Joe Biden really had luck, hence the name Lucky, right on his side. Amy, you want to uh, take a crack? Go ahead. I'll it's moving on Wednesdays, I feel like. <laughs> um, no, but uh, so I, I think, you know, from the, there are a lot of ways in which uh, we think lucky applies, um, mm -hmm. certainly to Biden. Um, we believe the Democratic Party was lucky to nominate Biden. They kind of had to find their way to him. Um, he was sort of the, um, you know, for, for many voters, he was a first choice, but for the majority of Democrats, he wasn't. And, um, you know, after we saw uh, what happened in the post-election period, and I think a lot of people felt this way beforehand, but certainly after the storming of the Capitol, I think the country was lucky that the Republic held in the face of all those pressures. But specific to Biden, um, you know, you start out with a campaign that was really having difficulty getting any traction uh, through 2019. Um, and then he gets to the Iowa caucuses or right before the Iowa caucuses, and there is uh, a poll that comes out. Betsy, I know you're super familiar with this poll, but the Des Moines <laughs> yeah. poll. Uh, that comes out right before the caucuses, about 48 hours ahead of time. And uh, it is uh, both uh, a bellwether of what's happening in the state of Iowa at the time, but also a little bit of an influencer for some of the voters. It tells them who's, who's legit and who's not. And Biden was going to come in uh, distant fourth in that poll uh, with about 13 uh, percent. But he was lucky in that uh, Pete Buttigieg's camp uh, found a flaw in the poll, and not the entire poll, but one phone call that got made, and they didn't like their standing in the poll, which had them third. And we go through this in the book, but this sort of kind of uh, caper-like hijinks, um, whatever you want to call it, that they go through um, to spike the poll to get CNN. And again, Betsy, this is something you would be familiar with, the, the intensity around a rollout of something like this. I remember that night in the Des Moines Marriott where people were going, everybody's looking at their phones, what's going on with the poll? And then, so CNN uh, eventually spikes the poll, yeah. um, and they don't they don't introduce it, and it saves Biden, um, you know, being cast as a loser right before the right. Iowa caucuses. Um, then a couple of days later, uh, the Iowa caucus reporting app, uh, the way that the each of the caucus locations was supposed to report into the state fails, and nobody knows uh, what the results are. And so Biden comes in fourth in Iowa, as the poll would have predicted, and um, he's spared 
sort of the political obituary writers ganging up on him at that point. He gets to New Hampshire. He's out of money. He's down to about a million and a half bucks. We report yeah. for the first time in this book that his aides went to him and said, uh, you know, you're uh, you're so far out of money, you, you might need to refinance a house to make p- payroll. Um, and, you know, he sticks in through it, but he comes in fifth in, in New Hampshire. He gets to Nevada. He's uh, He's got Mike Bloomberg breathing down his neck. Right. Um, you know, I think a lot of the Democratic establishment thought that Bloomberg would be able to come in for Biden. And then Elizabeth Warren just takes out Mike Bloomberg on the debate stage, you know, having nothing to do with Joe Biden. Um, and, and really Biden sort of uh, disappears in that moment. And everything else disappears in that moment, except for a struggling Mike Bloomberg who can't explain why he has non-disclosure agreements with uh, so many women or what's in them. Yeah. Um, so you fast forward a little bit to South Carolina and Biden has been working for uh, for many months to get Jim Clyburn to endorse him, the key endorsement in, in the Democratic primary process, really. Um, and he, we go through all of those machinations and Clyburn trying to uh, get Biden to uh, name, say that he would name a, a black woman to the Supreme Court. You know, Clyburn's like sitting in the audience uh, of a debate and Biden's not doing it. Clyburn rushes backstage in a commercial break and says to Biden, you know, you, uh, if you, you don't dare, don't you dare leave this stage without making that announcement. Biden goes out, kind of fumbles through it and says it, even though his aides had advised him not to do it. Um, the, the Clyburn endorsement, we don't think that Biden would have lost South Carolina, but we think it made a huge difference in terms of the margin, which then sort of touches off this domino effect of the establishment pulling behind him, Klobuchar yeah. and, and Buttigieg get out. At any rate, that's sort of the primary piece of luck. And then in the general election, he's got a president who mishandles the major crisis in front of him. Uh, Anita Dunn, one of the um, top advisors to Biden, told an associate, as we reported, uh, that COVID was the best thing that ever happened to Joe Biden. It put him uh, in his home, away from reporters, not making mistakes, keeping message discipline, while Trump's out there telling people to inject bleach. Um, You know, so it's you sort of go through all these things. And I think anybody who's successful in any venture would is lacking in humility if they tell you that it was all skill. But in this case, there was just an enormous amount of luck that that went Joe Biden's way. So there's those key moments that, yeah, like you said, make made a difference. Um, And let me ask you, because you all speaking of women, you all start the book with a scene um, taking place um, of Hillary Clinton's top advisors in December of 2018 who are getting together to discuss what you report was the re- very real possibility that she might actually have made another run in 2020. Tell us about that, um, because, you know, again, that also played into all of this. Um, and you all have chronicled a lot, I will say, um, of that 2016 race in your previous book, Shattered. And so uh, tell us about the Hillary factor just at the very beginning. Yeah, we thought it was appropriate um, having left everyone off at Shattered to actually yeah. begin with Hillary Clinton again. So we have her aides. So it's the same day as the George H.W. funeral in Washington. So she is in Washington. She was supposed to be in that meeting. She's not in that meeting. Um, it's being run by Huma Abedin, who mm-hmm. is sort of her chief advisor at the time. And um, lots of people who have been working, consulting for her are in that meeting. And, you know, Adam Parkamenko, who was someone who had worked for her, is in there. And um, he had already gone to, like, look for other work in the presidential election. Other people had moved on. Um, But, you know, they were they started talking. And Huma makes the point that Hillary hasn't ruled out not running yet. In Mm -hmm. her mind, she says she's still running. Um, and it's sort of a shocking moment because, you know, in our last book, we reported, um, at the very end that Hillary said that was my last race. Um, Right. And then we find out she's actually still in her mind considering running as of 2018. Um, and then we find out later in the book that she was still thinking about running. She also didn't think that Joe Biden could win. Um, and in 2019, in November of 2019, around Thanksgiving time, she is once again mm-hmm. thinking of running and throwing her name in the ring. And so I think that, um, you know, it, it explains a lot about where the Democratic Party was, how uncertain the party was, how even Hillary thought that she could 
inevitably come back and beat Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, everyone thought that Joe Biden couldn't win. Um, and, and we kind of talk a lot about that in the book. Not only did she feel that way, but President Obama felt that way. Other people felt that way. Right. And as Jonathan alluded to before, Mike Bloomberg even getting in the race was because of that in many ways, right? I mean, Mike Bloomberg had uh, yeah. $2 billion at the ready. Right, exactly. Uh, he was ready, that he thought he was going to spend to become the next president of the United States until he met Elizabeth Warren. Jonathan, let me ask you, just back on the Hillary notion, though, there was sort of this conventional wisdom after 2016 that because she lost, you know, did that actually, maybe that's where it's going to set women back from running in the future. Um, because, you know, maybe women weren't, after all, electable, right? If she wasn't electable, you know, would any woman be electable? But that that wasn't the case, as we saw. Yeah, it's a great question, Betsy. And let me just say, um, watching people come into this uh, into this forum um, on the side, I'm just excited yeah. to see people from Helena, Montana, and San Diego, <laughs> and um, and and of course, close to my heart in, in Washington D.C. and the Maryland suburbs. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great question, Betsy. As you said, six women ran. Yeah. Um, and so and they are some of the smartest, savviest political operators on their, you know, in their own right. Uh, and the lesson they took from Hillary Clinton losing was not that a woman couldn't win the presidency, but that a woman could win the presidency. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what Amy and I thought after shattered that Hillary Clinton had come so close that 77,000 votes over three states would have flipped the electoral college for her. Um, that that's an, you know, it's such a small margin, such a coin flip. Um, that it seemed pretty clear that a woman could win the presidency, that she'd proved that. Um, and yet, I think a lot of Democratic voters uh, took the opposite view and um, and felt like uh, there was a, a risk in nominating a woman again after Hillary Clinton. I think they a lot of them thought there was a risk in uh, nominating a person of color, including some people of color who felt that was a risk. Um, you know, Biden's core constituencies were, were sort of conservative white Democrats and African Americans. And right. I think a lot of the African Americans looked at his support among conservative white Democrats and said, that's a guy that can compete for Trump voters. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's a counterfactual to try to figure out whether one of the women who ran could have won the presidency this time, because there's no way to know. Um, but I think, I think we're at a point where, um, obviously gender still matters. Obviously there's a lot of misogyny in our society, but I also think that we're at a point where it's pretty clear that um, that a, a female candidate for president could win. Yeah, and as certainly the that. Hillary people will point out too, right? She actually did win the popular vote. That's right. You know, I'm sorry, Amy. What else were you saying? No, no, and, and you know, you kind of had that all kind of encapsulated in that moment with Elizabeth Warren and um, yeah, and Bernie Sanders, and that conversation that plays out behind the scenes where he essentially thinks that a woman can't win and can't beat Donald Trump. And I thought that that was such an interesting thing to, for him to say specifically on the heels of the 2016 race um, and what that meant. And clearly Elizabeth Warren didn't feel that way, uh, but she made it public that he thought that uh, that a woman couldn't win, which was another kind of uh, interesting moment in the campaign. And as, yeah. we know, as we know in the book, I'm, I'm sorry, Betsy. Yeah, no, go. I was just say, as we know in the book, um, yeah. You know, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders argued over whether he had told her a woman couldn't win the presidency. Right. There's a huge difference, as, and we report this, there's a huge difference between uh, what Bernie Sanders does coming out of a meeting and what Elizabeth Warren does coming out of a meeting. Bernie Sanders comes out of a meeting and tells his aides, uh, yeah, I think she's running, you know, like sort of a, like a basic like take from it. Elizabeth Warren is a, uh, is a, a lawyer who was a professor at Harvard. She makes a record of the meetings she has after those. <laughs> um, so when it comes to like, you know, he said, she said, um, I, I think she felt pretty confident that she was right about what happened in that in that room. Yeah. And you also, I mean, interestingly enough too, have this conversation of Warren um, and Biden back in 2015, when Biden was thinking about running in 2016, a conversation between those two, at which point, you all report that Biden actually says to her, you know, if he if he runs and gets the nomination, he's going to pick her as his vice president. Yeah, he had been thinking that way for a long time, I think, um, dating back to that point. Obviously, he didn't run for president. That's right. 
But in 2018, before he's announcing, he's on a plane talking to aides about the idea of picking a woman. Um, so that was clearly something mm -hmm. that he really wanted to do. He felt the need to, I think he knew he's an older white guy. Um, and he wanted to, on the heels of the 2016 election, wanted a woman to kind of have that glass shattering moment um, that Hillary didn't have. Um, and I think he thought it would be good for his ticket. Um, and turns out he was right. <laughs> Take us a little bit behind the scenes, as you all do in the book, about that decision that he made. Um, and his, first of all, coming out and saying that he would pick a, a woman. Um, and then, you know, this sort of um, <coughs> kind of uh, very publicly played out um, contest, essentially, and behind the scenes lobbying that went on um, among the women that were being considered. I mean, it's very dramatic of how you all write it in the book and talk about what was going on really behind the scenes when all of this was unfolding. Um, so tell us a, a little bit about that. Go for it, Amy. No, it's all you. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, I, going back to that moment with Elizabeth yeah. Warren, we know for a long time, Joe Biden has been thinking about a woman as a running mate. He says it to um, to some of his aides on a plane in late 2018. If he if he runs, he's going to pick a woman um, as his vice presidential candidate. It was the only news he made in the last debate with Bernie Sanders. Um, you know, as COVID was overtaking the country, uh, he made that pledge, um, which you know obviously um, you know cut the field in half and and arguably cut it uh, more than in half or cut it to a smaller slice because um, the number of women who have had the opportunity to serve in the kinds of roles that, um, you know, make them seem credible by existing standards uh, to, be, to be the vice presidential candidate is smaller than the number of men. I mean, look at the number of women in the Senate, number of women governors, et cetera. So, um, you know, Biden had this very long, drawn out process that I think started with Kamala Harris um, as sort of the obvious choice, but he and and certainly people around him were very resentful of uh, the way she went after him on a debate stage in the primary over right. the issue of school busing. Um, and and so it, there was this just just laborious process that I it basically invited for many of these women uh, mostly an opportunity to uh, to trash each other or have their allies trash trash it each other and it became um very acrimonious uh at, at, at one point cedric richmond who was the national co-chairman of uh of the biden campaign went to the harris people and said cut it out mm -hmm. uh, because they felt like uh she was too, doing too much to sabotage other candidates and and her office said it's not us um but we think that it was allies of her that were, were trashing some of the other candidates um and it's not clear whether cedric richmond said that because he thought she was being effective at getting rid of the competition, or she, or he said it as a, as a, a warm warning that uh, perhaps um, she would help herself best by not doing that. But Biden goes through this process. He has, you know, le a legal vetting team. He has Chris Dodd and a couple of others on a, a more political vetting team side. And he just he can't get himself to Kamala Harris. He he calls uh, Jim Clyburn a couple of days before he's about to make an announcement. He said, "I'm having this real battle between my head and and my heart," and his head is clearly Harris. She's the one who has, you know, is a sitting United States Senator. Right. Um, you know, so she's run for office before. She's been an attorney general before. She, he's seen her in the limelight. He knows she can do the, um, you know, the attack job that a vice presidential candidate can do because she did it to him. Um, right, right. So there are all these reasons that Kamala Harris makes sense and the polling makes sense, right? People know more than other candidates, people know who Kamala Harris uh, who, who Kamala Harris is, and some of the other candidates, like a Susan Rice, is not really well known publicly. So he's kind of asking Clyburn for permission to maybe go in another direction. Um, and at that point, the field was basically Harris, Warren, uh, Stacey Abrams to some extent, um, and and sort of a and Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, uh, who Biden had called in for the only personal meeting he did on this, the only one-on-one. -on -one. And there were several people around Biden who thought she was the right choice. Um, you know, uh, Mike Donilon, his his longtime sort of Biden whisperer, was in that yeah. camp, and Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think Biden came down to uh, to what all presidential candidates come down to, which is which of these candidates least harms me. 
Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and the answer was Kamala Harris. Right. And, it's, and sort of a short term advantage too, right? It, you know, he was not going to be causing a problem right after the, the initial announcement. Exactly. Um, but I do think that all along, Gretchen Whitmer had kind of caught his eye and was, uh -huh. she was the most similar to him. And he kept going back to her over time. Yeah. I think, you know, all of us had kind of ruled her out um, in hmm. the news media at the time. And they said, oh, you know, we all said, oh, she's too inexperienced. But we found out in reporting this book that he never ruled her out. He kept going back to her. He thought that she was very similar to his pol politics and was a very similar kind of politician and someone that he could work closely with. And I think there was always that little bit of distrust with Kamala. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, and, and whether or not she could be a team player, I think that was a huge factor. Um, there were donors who were close to Kamala at the time, and they were telling her, look, you're you're not being a true surrogate for him. You're talking a lot about yourself. You're not talking about Biden. And I think they all kind of found that a little bit tacky. Um, and mm. so it's it's interesting to see how he kind of came around and obviously thought that she could do the least damage to him. Yeah. Well, Amy Jonathan mentioned, you know, of course, Kamala going after Biden, as we all remember um, during that debate. But talk a little bit about sort of her presidential run. And you all talk in there specifically about black women in Kamala, that she was expect she was in many ways expected black women to develop sort of this natural affinity to her and they actually didn't. No. In fact they if you look at polling where they went, they went to Elizabeth Warren and they went to Joe Biden. Uh -huh. um, but they, they liked Warren a lot better, um, which her people kept pointing out throughout the election. Um, but yeah, I think her campaign started off very strong. She had a really strong rollout. Um, got great press, um, huge crowd, um, and and then she never quite gained the traction she needed, um, and which led us into that moment on stage in Miami where they they prepared for that moment because she does well in those moments. Mm -hmm. um, everyone around her said, you know, she's not really good at you know the day in and day out campaigning, but she is really solid at those those committee hearings that we all saw. Right, and, right you know, in, in the big speeches and in those big moments. So they specifically um, worked with her on a moment on going after him. Um, and so we take you behind the scenes on how that kind of played out, how they prepared for it, uh, first in Washington, then in Miami before the debate and how she was ready to kind of pounce on him. And, you know, of course, the Biden people at the, at the moment were all looking at that like she came in and, you know, did this hatch job and was like out for blood and they couldn't believe it. They were all stunned by it. I think Jill Biden was. I think all of them kind of had that in their minds going forward. But yeah, so going back to that, I think that is sort of why he kept kind of going. He didn't know whether or not she would be a team player. And I think that yeah. was always a huge factor. And, and Jonathan, you all write too about, you know, and you mentioned, you know, kind of Chris Dodd doing some of the vetting, but like this uncomfortable conversation with that he had with her, um, where she just sort of blew, I guess he asked her about it and she sort of blew it off as like just being politics and that didn't sit well either. No, it didn't. In fact, it, it's probably the only thing that really leaked out from the Biden vetting process. And, you know, we, we do in this book, one of the things I'm proud of about this book is uh, I think we give you an inside view of how the vetting process works in a way yeah, that, sure. um, is very difficult to get, not just Biden's vetting process, but how it works in, in general. And we do it as sort of a, a montage of, this is what Stacey Abrams' experience was like talking to somebody. This is what Kamala Harris's experience was in a different piece of the um, the vetting process. We we bring in uh, the black women's group that was pushing uh, for Biden to name a black woman um, and and in doing so was um, you know sort of subtly pushing for Kamala Harris because she was the the black woman who had probably the best you know traditional credentials as we were talking about before. So mm -hmm. you know I think this is um, you know I I think that part of the book and that part of the the sort of um, general election campaign you know the most important decision that a, a president makes um, in terms of, of telegraphing to people what he's going to do is uh, is is really sort of fascinating to get in in behind the wheels on uh, the other thing i would just say about that is um you know kamala harris's best group was one that biden needed to hold strong which was educated women um you know regardless of color and it's yeah. sort of a 
you know, yes, there was the piece where um, she was intended to excite African American voters, but um, it should not be lost that her her popularity is pretty strong. With you know what what probably I would imagine a lot of the people watching this, um, you know, women women with college degrees, and they were essential to to Joe Biden's victory and really the turn against Trump in the midterms. And Amy, um, two of the other names, you know, um, we mentioned Stacey Abrams. Talk a little bit about her role in the campaign, because she's certainly someone that, you know, has a political future ahead of her. And this notion of, um, you know, how what her role was. And then also, I think another woman that you all spent some time talking about that, you know, made a difference, certainly in the general election, was Cindy McCain um, yeah. out in Arizona. Yeah, so I think with Stacey Abrams, he obviously, Joe Biden considers her for to be his running mate mm -hmm. um, and, and meets with her early on because he sees that she is this rising star in the Democratic Party and he really wants her endorsement. We kind of go into this whole thing about how, you know, he tried to get endorsements from Al Sharpton and he, he made the rounds. He went to Stacey Abrams. They have kind of a a nice little lunch at his house um, over sandwiches and they're talking and they're getting to know each other. Um, and he recognizes the power that she does have. And so he kind of keeps her around and, and is really considering her um, for his VP. Um, and, you know, she's in the process until the very end. Um, I think that speaks a lot about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the role she had in this election and the power um, that she played, particularly in a state like inevitably what we saw in Georgia, um, and he knew this. Yeah. But he he kind of in the end comes back to her at the very end of the process and says, "Look, you know," and she knows it's it's a little heartbreaking. Like we've all been her in that yeah. moment because she she's the underdog, um, right? And she really really wants the job and is really making a solid effort and is campaigning for it, but they all are, but she is really campaigning for it and gets kind of in trouble for it, which is why John mentioned this group of black women, obviously that yeah. kind of champions her and other people, because they, they don't want that image of her kind of out there that she's campaigning for this position. Um, but in the end, you kind of, your heart breaks a little bit for her, I think as a woman, um, because he kind of tells her, look, like you're great and all, but um you're not experienced and um and so i'm gonna have to pass on you and then i mean the the irony there is that she ends up sort of saving him in georgia yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah and then cindy mccain comes out in arizona and saves him there too in a state that you know no one thought that he that um biden could win exactly and you saw she was sort of very emblematic of um, the Republican Party at the end, like the traditional establishment kind of coming forward, someone he had campaigned against with Barack Obama, who's the wife of um, John McCain, kind of coming forward. Um, and the two of them are sort of like bookends, um, mm -hmm. you know, helping him out in these two pivotal states that ultimately carried him in the election. Um, I alluded to this earlier in the, in the beginning, but I wanted to also spend a little bit of time on sort of some of the key women within the campaign, um, some of the key women staff. And you all, you know, do a lot of sort of inside the infighting that's going back and forth. Obviously, there was a big turnover in the campaign um, right after South Carolina. Uh, or maybe it was right after Super Tuesday. And um, talk about the roles that Anita Dunn, who um, long time in politics, of course, you know, kind of comes in as a senior advisor to sort of right the ship. And then, you know, turning those reins over to uh, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who ends up running the campaign. And she certainly has her share of distractors um, that you all um, write about as well. Um, talk to us about the role of, of some of these senior women within the campaign. Well, there's a soft coup that uh, starts being engineered in like November 2019 against the campaign manager, Greg Schultz. Uh, and there's a feeling among Biden's senior advisors that he's just not getting the job done. Um, and some of the things Biden's struggling with, you know, I think we, we would attribute to candidate problems more than staff problems. But even with that, they felt Schultz was not uh, really up to managing a presidential level campaign. And so over the course of a few months, Anita Dunn starts taking a little bit more power and ultimately she becomes the interim campaign manager um right you know sort of in the in the new hampshire period and she 
dispatches some aides to Nevada and South Carolina and basically says to them, look, um, you know, we're running two Senate primary campaigns. And that's that's what we have to do is basically look at this like Senate, two Senate campaigns, win these states or at least do well enough in Nevada to make it to South Carolina and then win South Carolina. And um, Anita is somebody who really has management ability. Um, and, you know, it's not something she wanted to do long term. She is not somebody who knows the X's and O's of, um, you know, field operations and all the things that you need to do. Uh, for a major long campaign, but um, but certainly somebody who is able to to make decisions quickly, which Greg Schultz was not particularly good at for a variety of reasons. And so, uh, but Anita has been trying to bring in Jen O'Malley Dillon yeah. for months at this point. And Jen, we wrote about her in Shattered. She was the runner up to get Hillary Clinton's campaign manager job. Um, and, you know, when we wrote that uh, way back when, uh, the the implication was that Hillary might might have done better having chosen her, um, in part because of her real handle on operations and her um, she has an ability to both please the the people above her and work with the people below her, but, yeah. but she's not willing to give up the project to please her bosses, um, and so she's she's very focused. And so Jen comes in um, as a volunteer and goes to Nevada, and she's thinking as we report, um, there's a pretty good chance I'm just going to be helping Joe Biden wrap up his presidential campaign. Um, right, because at that point, yeah, it didn't look good. Right, and, you know, if, you know, so if that's the case, she loses only a week of her time, and if uh, Biden's able to turn it around, then suddenly she's looking at the prospect of running a presidential campaign for the first time, and um, you know, Jen did have detractors within the campaign. There were people who were upset about uh, her bringing in um, an army of Obama-era folks to help uh, be her top lieutenants. There were people who felt like she didn't know Joe Biden's leanings. We write about their battle over what to do during the um, summer of uh, protests over racial injustice and, um, you know, people trying to tilt Joe Biden a little further left. Uh, Jen O'Malley Dillon was one of them. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, she ran a, an aggressive and effective political campaign in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and, and really proved herself. Um, and, you know, Kelly, Kellyanne Conway was the first woman uh, to manage a winning presidential campaign, but Kellyanne was not the, the fingers on all the buttons in that campaign. I mean, she was a front person um, in a way that's very different from uh, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who, who actually was in charge of all the nuts and bolts. Um, Take us back to South Carolina, because you mentioned this in the beginning and this um, in Clyburn sort of hanging, I guess, I don't know, you guys say it wasn't exactly like if you if I endorse you, you must promise to put a you know black woman on the Supreme Court. But it was kind of close to that. Right. Um, why was that important to Clyburn? Um, and just tell us a little bit more about how that all unfolded um, in that debate. Can I interject real quick here? Yeah. Amy, I want you to answer the question. I have to leave the camera for a minute to get a computer cord because I oh, okay. yeah. I'm not <laughs> no plugged worries. in. So I'm gonna run away for a minute and come back okay. and I'll throw no it <laughs> um, Yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating um, little anecdote in the book, but really what we what we find out is that Clyburn really feels like having a black woman um, on the bench is permanent, is like a very permanent lasting mm -hmm. thing. Um, he wanted Obama to do it. He got pushback from Obama at the time. It was really something that was really um, important to him at his core. And um, so he talked to Biden about it. He had his endorsement sort of ready to go, but didn't really, he had the video cut and all of that, but he hadn't made the endorsement yet. So he kind of kept the, the carrot dangling in front of Biden a little bit. And um, I think one of the best anecdotes in, in the book is we, we have this scene where Biden is at the South Carolina debate and he's in the crowd and he's watching the debate in real time play out, big as life in front of him. Yeah. And, he um, he is seeing that Biden is not talking about it, and he's, <laughs> he had he's these are missed opportunities. There have been like countless times where he could have brought this up. So he's sitting there and growing really impatient. And finally, there's a commercial break, and he rushes out of his chair 
And <laughs> his colleagues that are sitting with him think that he's going to the bathroom because he's doing it with so much urgency. <laughs> what he's doing is he's going to find Joe Biden backstage and he sees Pete Buttigieg kind of approach him and he goes around him to kind of find Biden. He sees Biden, makes a beeline for him. And is like, come on, man, you, you've had a million opportunities. You haven't really talked about this yet. And I want to see you do this before you leave the stage tonight. And so, um, so you have this moment. And, you know, of course, we all saw how it played out. He did right. And it was sort it. of inartful. I mean, it was kind of out of nowhere, like in his closing statement. And I remember at the time thinking, where did that come from? You know? <laughs> right. Exactly. And now you know. Now we know. So yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> um, Wait, what did I miss? <laughs> oh, you missed all the all the behind the scenes of Clyburn rushing up to Biden uh, in the debate to say, "What about what about the uh, black woman on the court?" I'll have to I'll have to read that in in uh, yeah. your <laughs> So speaking of Mayor Pete, there's a question about um, Mayor Pete in the questions. Let me ask you that now from Larry who says, what's the story behind Mayor Pete and Klobuchar dropping before Super Tuesday? Was that an Obama mission? Yes, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> a little bit. Um, so what happens uh, after Super Tuesday, I mean, uh, before Super Tuesday and after yeah. South Carolina, I mean, Mayor Pete and Klobuchar had political reality in front of them. Uh, neither one of them had any you know, virtually any support among people of color. Right. It's almost impossible to win a Democratic nomination, particularly in a multi-candidate field, if you're relying entirely on white voters. And even if you were to get to a contested convention, having done that, uh, the optics of that would have been terrible. <laughs> so, I mean, they they, they kind of know where their standing is. But um, Pete Mayor Pete's team talked to him the night of the South Carolina primary. He lands in America's Georgia um, because he's going to go meet with Jimmy Carter the next day. And they walk him through it all, and they basically tell him, um, in order to preserve your standing in the Democratic Party, you need to get out now. Right. Um, and uh, Obama calls Klobuchar, um, and Klobuchar doesn't return his call. Um, <laughs> she obviously knows what he's calling about. So she decides she wants to meet up with Pete and talk to him about what they should both do. Uh, and she's waiting for him in an airport in uh, in Alabama. Uh, they're about to go do the the Selma march together, um, the annual uh, commemoration of Bloody Sunday. And she's waiting for Pete in an airport. And Pete is meeting with Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter says to Pete, um, "You know, you've run a great campaign, but." And Pete knows immediately when he hears the "but." This guy's telling me to get, Jimmy Carter is telling me to get out of this race uh, in so many words. And so, of course, very diplomatically, Jimmy Carter, right? Right, very diplomatically. He never says "get out." He just yeah. says you've run a good race. But so, uh, so Klobuchar is waiting for uh, Buttigieg in the airport, and um, and ultimately Buttigieg is delayed, and so she doesn't meet with them. She ends up in uh, in the church, um, you know, outside the Selma Bridge, and uh, she decides in a quiet moment by herself that at least this is you know what we what we report and what we've been told that she's gonna she's gonna get out of the race. Um, Pete drops out that night, uh, goes back to South Bend. Surprise announcement: goes back and uh, and and says he's getting out of the race, but he hasn't made an endorsement yet. And Klobuchar has done neither. So Biden calls Buttigieg and asks for his endorsement, and Buttigieg kind of demurs. And then Barack Obama follows up and says to Pete, look, you're not going to have any more clout than you do right now, because if you wait till Super Tuesday and you have a bad Super Tuesday, no one's going to care what you think, you know, right, basically, right. and you will not have affected the race. Whereas if you get out now, you both may have an influence on the race. You'll be able to take credit for uh, influencing the race and you will be looked upon as somebody who helped save the Democratic Party from Bernie Sanders. So at that point, and one day you can be transgender, right? Right. right. <laughs> and also, just to back to to backpedal about twenty four hours. Yeah. Um, Barack Obama's fundraising guy, Rufus uh, Gifford, sends out an email the morning after the South Carolina primary to Obama's um, national fundraising group, which is about eight hundred people who backed the Obama campaigns and helped him. Uh, raise money and, and and basically says now's the time to get off the sidelines, get behind Biden. So you see these like these Obama fingerprints 
all over the place. And, you know, we know that all of these campaign aides talk to each other across campaigns. Um, you know, Anita Dunn had relationships with each of the other Democratic campaigns. There was there was definitely a push from Obama world for other Democrats, other influential Democrats to get behind Biden. And we, uh, you know, I don't think we ever, we, did, we weren't able to report all of those pieces. And I don't think anybody will ever be able to report all of those pieces. But uh, Barack Obama can, can claim credit for having helped bring the party behind Joe Biden in those incredibly important 72 hours before between the South Carolina primary and Biden's big Super Tuesday win. And then with Bernie Sanders, too, because yeah. inevitably, um, I think everyone was scared that Bernie would kind of stay in the race like he did in 2016. And that was the huge Democratic Party nightmare. Right. What would he do? And um, they, they didn't want a deja vu scenario. And so Obama was pivotal in kind of um, making those calls. I think he made four calls to Bernie Sanders to kind of hear him out, to let him kind of end the campaign on his own, but to find mm -hmm. out kind of what his big asks were and mm -hmm. what he wanted out of it. Um, so you saw Obama kind of come out a little more toward the end and really sort of act like the patriarch of the party. But yet you all, Amy Wright, are just to rewind, early on in the primary process, Obama was not in any, any situation all in for Joe Biden. Um, he was, I mean, you guys report about, um, was it Elizabeth Warren fundraiser where, um, it was a fundraiser where he basically says that he was going to, you know, support Elizabeth Warren, right? Yeah. It's a fundraiser for the Obama foundation. Foundation. Um, yeah. And he is, he's meeting with a group of 40 very successful black CEOs. And, and this was to, when, what, what time period was this? This like, is October of 2019. Okay. Um, and so Elizabeth Warren is kind of surging in the polls at the time. And yeah. he, I think he thinks that she's doing a pretty good job and he can kind of relate to her campaign a little more. I think if you narrow down the candidates, um, he thought that she was running the best campaign, the, the campaign mm -hmm. kind of most like his, with the most energy, with the best people, um, and so it, according to people in the room, he feels like he can, he, he likes these guys, he trusts them. And so he, he can be more candid. Um, people in the room said that they had never seen him be so candid, um, about the race, uh, with anyone. And so they're asking him this group of donors. So what do you think of the horse race? Who's up and who's down? And he's giving kind of this very, this huge sermon, almost like, uh, as it was described to us about Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. And he he isn't really saying much about Kamala Harris. He's kind of jabbing Pete and calling him short and gay and kind of doing it in jest. But people are kind of taken aback by it. And then he forgets Joe Biden. And he has to be reminded by a donor in the room, <laughs> what about Biden, uh, which is the, the chapter, uh, it's the name of our, one of our chapters. But it, it was a telling moment because it revealed kind of where his mind was and what yeah. he thought of Biden um, in that moment. And he definitely didn't think that he could win, I don't think. And if you rewind a little bit to um, the beginning of the campaign, Biden meets with, uh, I'm sorry, Obama meets with uh -huh. Biden aides and says to them, uh, not that he's afraid that Joe Biden's going to lose the primary, but that he's afraid that Biden is going to embarrass himself, tarnish the Biden uh, Biden legacy, and in doing so, tarnish the Obama legacy. So he has this sort of gut check meeting with top Biden aides and says, "Whatever you do, you got to make sure that he doesn't, you know, belly flop here. Right. He, he could really, really hurt himself." And and you know, Obama doesn't say it, but obviously, if, if Biden, you know, had an ugly primary uh, exit, it, it might have uh, spoken to the. Uh, perception of weakness of, of Obama's brand at that point. Yeah. Um, let me ask a question from Rita, who says, um, what deal did Warren cut with Biden? Uh, the economic plan and the elevation of Yellen definitely has her fingerprints all over it. She is currently pulling Biden left. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not sure that there was a deal per se with Warren. I think it's more that um, that Biden understands that economic populism has really risen on both the left and the right. And one of the reasons that she saw a surge uh, in 2019 is that her message was resonating with a lot of Democratic voters. Um, and so, um, you know, it's not just Elizabeth Warren who, who puts that pressure on him, although she's at the forefront of it and certainly the face of it. But I mean, there are plenty of 
progressive senators um, and not just Bernie Sanders. I mean, we've talked about Jeff Merkley, people like that, who who really wanted to see, um, and, and certainly Elizabeth Warren talks a lot about personnel being policy, who wanted to see Biden's picks be people that they could get behind, people that they could support, people who saw the economy the way they did, or at least some of the flaws the way that they did. And honestly, in a 50-50 Senate, uh, every single one of those Democratic senators has the ability to, to cast a veto. So I think you know, one of the things Biden has always been very good at is uh, maintaining positive working relationships with other people. He talked about it yeah. on the campaign, and it's, it's very true. Um, these, the Democratic senators want him to do well. They like him, um, and it matters, mm -hmm. things like that. Amy, let me ask you too about Warren um, and her presidential run, because I mean, what impact when we think about gender, you know, she had spent, you know, had to spend some time certainly in one of the debates talking about the issue of electability um, in many cases, but she also, you know, we saw her lining up, you know, having little girls line up to do their selfies with her, um, you know, and ultimately her campaign was wasn't successful. And I guess, just your thoughts on gender and then kind of what was what were the main one or two factors that, um, you know, made her not um, come out as viable in, in the campaign ultimately? Yeah, I think she she definitely was someone who stood out, someone who, um, you know, there was one point in the race where all the women were doing kind of badly. And then she kind of came out, um, started doing these selfie lines, really yeah. started energizing people um, and people really um, related to her in some, in, in a very palpable way. I think she'd also, you know, hired the best people. She was out there out front. She was the first candidate who announced that she was running. So she, um, a lot of people said that she hired, um, the best people on the ground in each of the, um, the primary states. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I do think that she definitely played, um, more of the most, she, she ran, I think pretty much the best campaign you can run, except she didn't win. So I don't know how you square that. Um, but she, you know, she was, she had her original, this thing, the selfie line, which we talk about in the book, right. how her, her aides thought that she'll hate it. She ended up. Yeah. I love it. that backstory on how that all came about. Yeah. It was, it's kind of a fun little story about, you know, how they were like, Oh, she'll never do this. And then she ends up loving it and she continues to do it. Um, and it became such a staple of her campaign. I felt like mm -hmm. she was running kind of like what a 21st century campaign should look like. It's just her issues. I think that there were some things with Medicare and other issues that she couldn't quite explain so well. Um, but if she had, um, people think that she would have been the nominee. A lot of people we talked mm -hmm. to along the way said, you know, she, she was running that kind of campaign that could have actually won. Um, and so... I think if she had another chance, maybe another go at it, she probably would have done things a little differently. And yet, you know, as you talk about Jonathan, she was instrumental in getting rid of Bloomberg and his billions of dollars when it when it mattered most. And really, it's interesting. She ran the campaign in a way in which she really didn't um, she didn't talk about gender. She showed yeah. a little bit, you know, the pinky promises yeah. and, and, yeah. The, and the selfies with little girls. But she didn't talk about it in the way, say, Hillary Clinton did. Her approach was very different. And yet that moment she went after Bloomberg was basically her saying, you're a disgusting pig. I mean, like, you know, in, in so many words. And we take you th through her thought process in this book about, like, how she's lining up for that moment and what she really thinks about Bloomberg and, and how he reminds her of Trump. Um, and so there is at the very sort of end here, if not an explicit um sort of gender thing that's going on where she, I mean, she's not, she is, but she is very close to explicitly standing up for these women with the NDAs. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I just thought that was an interesting dynamic that she, um, you know, evolved and then evolved the way that she was dealing with this. And then at the end of the campaign, she says, um, you know, basically um, she's damned if she does and damned if she doesn't talk about misogyny and politics. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she obviously felt it. And I think every one of the women who's run for office has felt it. And, um, you know, I, I, they all handle it a little differently. But um, there is that uh, that double bind that goes on that I think, um, you know, she tried to avoid for as long as possible and, and was pretty successful at it for most of the campaign. And one of my favorite quotes in the book yeah. is actually something 
Um, someone says, only in America, this comes after the Clyburn endorsement um, and Warren kind of taking out Bloomberg. But uh, the quote is something like, only in America could a white woman and a black man kind of um, take out John, I always mess this up. It's, it, <laughs> only in America could a white woman and a, a black man do all the work and the white guy walks away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surprise, <laughs> which says it all. It says it all about, you know, what we went through in this election. Um, and yeah, it, it resonates. It's so true. Um, let's see. A lot of it, a lot of intrigue in the questions, too, about the VP process. More intrigue here. Uh, here's a question from um, Caitlin. She says, um, had Biden selected Elizabeth Warren or Gretchen Whitmer as his VP, do you think Democrats and independents would have turned out the same way for him? Do you think his selection of Kamala Harris and the timing of COVID-19 boosted Biden to victory? I think that we definitely think that COVID played a big role yeah. in this um, mm -hmm. because it, you know, it allowed Trump to kind of implode. Um, and people had said to us, had he been just a tad more presidential, had he been a tad more empathetic, um, he could have probably won this, this race um, because the economy was doing pretty well before then. Everything was sort of going his way. Um, he, he kind of butchered it. And at the same time, Biden kind of let him implode by getting off the campaign trail, staying in his basement. He was ridiculed for that. But, yeah. um, but as Anita Dunn says, his senior advisor says in the book, it's the best thing that ever happened to him because his aides were so worried about him stepping in it as he had been prone to do so many times. And I think that they were worried that he would do that to himself again and shoot himself in the foot and say things that he didn't intend to say. Yeah. And, um, and that would dominate the news cycles. And he never had those moments. And, and Jonathan, you all do, I mean, even though the book is about Biden, you all do spend time going behind the scenes a little bit on Trump campaign and sort of the decisions you know, for example, that the rally that we all remember in Oklahoma, right, that he um, insists on having inside and then that that debacle that that happened. Um, talk a little bit more about, yeah, the Trump um, as I guess as lucky as Biden was. And do you just attribute Trump to just misstep after misstep? Yes. Um, <laughs> the short answer, I mean. <laughs> I mean, look, Donald Trump got 74 million votes, which was, you know, 12 million or so more than he had in the previous election. So, yeah. um, you know, my analysis uh, was wrong that he couldn't do better by, um, you know, significantly better by uh, just tailoring to his base. But I was right in the thought that he was pushing away <laughs> as yeah. many more people uh, as he was, it was gaining them. Um, I think that, you know, number one, um, it, his internal polling suggested that he, he was in really good shape in February. And as we report in the book, he um, he's talking to Brad Parscale, his campaign manager, as COVID's starting, and even really before it hits the United States in a big way. Mm -hmm. And Parscale says, you know, you got to be careful about this, Mr. President. This could be your undoing. And and Trump says, what, is, what the hell does this have to do with politics? Um, and I think right. unlike... Unlike pretty much every other experienced politician, and of course Trump is not an experienced politician, he doesn't realize the opportunity that there is in crisis. You know, Amy said, uh, you know, when she was talking, he had a good economy before uh, before the pandemic hit. Um, you know, he even had the ability to say the economy was getting better uh, after it hit. Even more important, people didn't blame him for the existence of the disease, right? I mean, uh -huh. Uh -huh. obviously some partisans did, but not everybody did, and so. You know, Trump really just fumbles what uh, what a smart, savvy politician would have looked like looked at it as an opportunity to rally people around the flag, to rally them around a purpose. There was opportunity for him to reach out to Democratic voters. He just kicked all that away, and then he gets COVID, um, and you know acts ridiculously after that, and it's no good for him. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think Trump really kicked this election away. So I want to end with the way you guys end in the book, because um, this quote from Biden um, and you guys have, uh, let's see, for the new part, let me just read the last last paragraph. Um, and it's not it's not going to give away anything. Right. Because we, we all know how this turns out. <laughs> it's not a spoiler alert um, for the new president. There were many reasons to feel fortunate, but the most relevant was the one uh, he often attributed to his father 
quote, it is the lucky person who gets up in the morning, puts both feet on the floor, knows what they are about to do and thinks it still matters. So I thought that was a great quote to end with. <laughs> yeah, this is a guy yeah. who believes in luck and in fortune. Exactly. And, you know, the other day, their photographers um, took pictures of him crossing his fingers. This is a guy who really does believe in good luck. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I want to just let everybody know before we go um, of two other upcoming um, Women on Wednesdays that we have that we hope you'll join us for. Um, next week, we are going to have a discussion with... Um, Former HHS Secretary and Member of Congress Donna Salela, um, Patrice Harris, who is the immediate past president of the American Medical Association, and Lori Rubiner of the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids to talk about how women are really playing a major um, leadership role uh, in the fight to, um, to end tobacco use. And then um, later in May, um, we hope you will join us for um, our um, friend and colleague, Karen Tumulty, um, who has a new book out um, called The Triumph of Nancy Reagan, that May 12th. So she will uh, she will be here um, for that with us. And so we hope uh, we hope you can join us uh, for that as well. But um, Amy and Jonathan, thank you so much for this book. Um, I've already lost the, the front cover of it, but <laughs> somewhere in my house. You're reading it like 50 Shades of Grey. Exactly. You don't want people to know. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, thank you for this great book and for joining us tonight. And thanks, everybody, for your questions. And we hope that we will um, see everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Take thank care. Thank you to everyone else. <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Absolutely.